Hello and welcome to the next session. This is a look at hedge accounting under IFRS 9. Now this used to be under IAS 39, so there are some changes from that once we've transitioned now into IFRS 9. But we're going to start with the basics because sometimes in quite a complex area like this, uh, students get worried about, oh, it's very complicated and difficult. It's not really if you stick to the basics and build up to some of the more complex areas. So what are we actually talking about here with hedge accounting? Well, we're hedging the risk of a fall in value of a financial instrument. Usually we're going to do that with the derivatives. So we have some item that we think is going to change in value and we're worried about it. So we're going to hedge that risk and that is going to reduce short term volatility. That's effectively what hedge accounting is. Hedging the risk of a fall in value, usually of a financial instrument with a derivative. And it's a method that's used to reduce volatility and if we meet certain criteria, well then we can usually offset the two movements in profit or loss. And that's what hedge accounting is. Otherwise, we just have two items treated separately in the financial statements. Whereas if we've got the hedge accounting, we can offset it and show the reasons why we did it. So I said we'll usually do this with a derivative and it's useful here to understand what a derivative is. Again, often it's an area that students get worried about. They hear derivative and it sounds complicated, but it's really not. All a derivative is, is a financial instrument that derives its value from the price of an underlying asset, price or indeed rate. Now, what I mean by that is that underlying price, asset or rate will be something like gold. The derivative will derive its price from gold. So let's say it was a future on gold. Well, a future on gold will derive its price from the price of gold. A future on the euro will derive its price from the price of the euro. So derivative just means that it derives its price from something else. So I know it sounds complicated, but it's not really. And some of the characteristics of a derivative are, first of all, little or no investment. And that's important because you may well need to recognize one of these in the exam. So if there's little or no initial investment at the start, and it's a financial instrument, that's often a derivative. It will be settled in the future and the price fluctuates with that underlying asset price or rate. So for example, if we had a future on gold, like I've already mentioned, it doesn't cost you anything to take out that future on gold. You'll take it out for a period of time, usually three months, so it's settled after the three months. And if the price of gold goes up, so the price of the future will go up. So the price fluctuates and then when it's settled, you pay the difference between its value now and the value it was when you took it on. So although there's little or no investment, you can make a profit or a loss because the difference will be the little or no investment to what it is when you settle it. So let's say it moved by $50 in that period of time, you would have to pay the $50 movement from the date you took it out to the date it was settled. So that's what a derivative is. It's something that derives its value from an underlying asset price or rate. It usually doesn't cost you anything to take it out. It will then fluctuate in value and when you settle it, you pay the difference between your initial investment and what it was worth on the date that you settle it. Now, you will need to be aware of a few different types of a derivative. 
So for example, you should know what a forward contract is. You'll have met these previously. It's a contract to buy or sell at a set price on a set date, usually for a currency. So you take out a forward contract on a currency. It doesn't cost you anything to take out that forward rate. You simply agree it with the bank. And on that date, you receive the money and the bank gives you the rate that was agreed. For a future, I've already mentioned, these are exchange traded forward contracts effectively. Again, you take it out on a certain date. It may well fluctuate in value and then you settle it on a future date. For options, these are slightly different. This is the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell the underlying currency or asset and that will be on or before a certain date. So options is literally what it says, the option to buy something. The key bit there is that you don't have to take up the option. So in fact, you do pay a premium initially for an option. So it has got some payment at the start. For a swap, well, that's an agreement to swap periodic payments, usually interest payments. So you might use that to hedge interest rate risk. For a forward rate agreement, again, that's on interest rates. It enables you to fix the interest on a floating loan. So there are various different types. You will have heard of some of them before. You don't really need to know them in detail. You just need to recognize that they are derivatives, something with little or no investment that a will fluctuate in value, you settle it in the future, and then you settle with the difference between what you paid and what it's worth at the end. So let's just think about that measurement. So as I've said, there's initially usually zero value to a derivative. It's always measured at fair value through profit and loss, with some slight exceptions, which I'll talk about shortly but usually we're going fair value through profit and loss, which means you revalue it each year with the gain or loss to profit or loss. So initial value zero, and then you revalue it to fair value at the year end. That will create a gain or a loss between your initial value and the value it is on that date. That goes to profit or loss unless it is a designated cash flow hedge. And we'll talk about what happens in that later on, but I just want to point it out here. So usually the treatment is fair value through profit and loss, unless it's a designated cash flow hedge. And we'll look at that shortly. Let's then look at illustrations one or and two to get an idea of how these derivatives are recognized and measured. We'll then go on to look at how we can use them in hedge accounting. In this illustration, we have a jewelry manufacturer worried about the price of gold. They're going to buy 1000 ounces. So enter into a futures contract in order to offset that. So what we want to do is just show the accounting entries to record the futures contract. The futures contract will be a derivative, which we know is initially recognized at little or no value. We then account for the movement between the value on the date that we purchased it or entered into it and the year end date. So starting here, the initial cost of the futures will be zero. And remember, that's one of the characteristics of a derivative. By the year end, it is moved in value creating a gain. So although we recorded it at zero, we need to record now the difference between what it was worth then and the year end amount. So ABC is a contract to buy at 1235, whereas it would now have cost 1300. So they could sell the future at that price if they wanted to, that's a gain. The gain is the difference between those two prices. The price where it was when you initially took out the future and the price at the year end or on the date that you settle it. 
So here we would have to take the difference between the 1, 2, 3, 5 and the 1300 times the 1000 ounces because this is per ounce and we expect 1000 ounces. So the difference between those two will equate to a value of 65,000. So we'll create a financial asset of that and we'll credit the gain to profit or loss. So that's how a derivative is treated. We will have an initial value of zero and then we'll revalue it at the year end to fair value with the difference between the price at which we took it out and the year end price creating a financial asset or liability if it was a loss. In this case, it was a gain, which creates an asset to go to profit and loss as well. So see if you can have a go at illustration two. This is the detail again. This will have no value at the start. It's a forward contract. But then at the year end, we'll have to work out what's the difference between the price we got and the price now and create either a financial asset or liability and take it to profit and loss as well. So see if you can pause the video and do this before working through the answer with me. Okay, so like all derivatives, little or no value at inception. However, the forward contract amount that we would expect on that date was at a rate of 1.4. So that's 285714. By the year end, well, the rate had moved to 1.45. So the spot value would be 275862. So what we need to do is take the difference between those two and it actually this time will be an asset also because actually we're getting it at a better rate than we would have done if we left it for the spot rate. So we're getting 285714. If we had done nothing, we'd get 275862. The difference between the two is the asset created by the forward. So that's 9852. And that's an asset we would create as a financial asset and again to profit or loss. So this is the treatment for all of our derivatives they're recognized at little or no value, so usually zero, and then the movement between the price on the date you agreed it and the date you settle it will create a financial asset or liability and go to profit or loss. We now know, number one, what a derivative is, number two, how to measure it, and we're now going to go on to look at how we use it in this hedge accounting. So the process in hedge accounting is that we make use of a hedging instrument. So a hedging instrument is usually a derivative, but the key thing is that it's external to the organization. So it could be an external derivative. It might be a non-derivative also, but usually the hedging instrument the thing that you're using to hedge your risk is a derivative. Now, some key things in IFRS 9 are that you can use a proportion of a derivative, not necessarily all of it. So that might mean, for example, using the intrinsic value of an option rather than the full value of the exercise price. That's a little bit technical. Just be aware that you can use a proportion of a derivative and you can use a combination as a hedging instrument. The key thing that we'll look at later on here is that there needs to be an economic relationship between your hedging instrument that you're using to undertake the hedge and the hedged item, the thing that you're trying to hedge. So a hedging instrument is external to the organization, it's usually a derivative. You can use a proportion or a combination of derivatives in order to do this. And remember, the hedging instrument is used to offset losses in a hedged item. So a hedged item might be a future amount that you have to pay in a foreign currency, 
or it might be an asset that you have in your balance sheet. Let's say you have some shares in another organization that you own and you're worried about them going down in value. Well, you might use a hedging instrument to hedge that risk. Now, some of the key aspects for IFRS 9 are that a hedged item will usually be a financial asset or combination of assets. It also allows you to group together certain assets uh, in order to hedge a group of items. However, in order to group them together, they need to all be individually eligible. And we'll look at the eligibility criteria shortly. They all need to be managed together. And it may well be that they're a foreign exchange risk. So you may group them together if they're individually eligible and managed together. Usually that's going to be some sort of foreign exchange risk. So effectively the process is we're going to use a hedging instrument, usually a derivative, to offset losses in a hedged item, usually an asset that you've got and you're worried about making losses on it. Some of those little technicalities are just ones that you need to learn and look out for in the exam. So some of the technical aspects to this, and this again is some areas that the examiner may throw into a scenario to see if you know, for example, what the requirements are. So those requirements that I just mentioned are, number one, the item and the instrument must both be eligible. So they must meet the criteria that we've just talked about so the item will be external. You can use a proportion under certain circumstances and a combination can be allowed. And you might group together certain items. So they must be eligible and you must formally document and designate the hedge. So you must say, this is the hedging instrument, this is the hedged item, and this is the effect that we're trying to achieve. So the items must be eligible. You've got to formally document and designate the hedge and the hedge must be effective. So there are requirements for what makes it effective, which we need to look at. So to make the hedge effective, number one, there must be an economic relationship. And that just means there needs to be a correlation between the hedging instrument and the hedged item. But that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if there was no correlation, well then the movements on one wouldn't offset the movements on the other. There would be no relationship between the two. So to make it effective, obviously there needs to be a relationship. The second requirement for an effective hedge is that the changes in value of the item and the instrument can't be caused by credit risk, i.e. your credit worthiness. They need to be caused by the risk being hedged. So for example, let's say it was a foreign bond on an organization. Well, if the organization became less credit worthy, that will affect the value of the bond. However, that's not the risk we're hedging. We're hedging the foreign exchange. So actually, we're only interested in the movements on the bond caused by movements in foreign exchange. Again, it's a little bit technical, but just know the rule that the change in value mustn't be caused by credit risk. It should be caused by the risk being hedged. Lastly, the hedged amounts should match. So all we mean by that is that if we have a bond worth two million that we want to hedge, we shouldn't take out a derivative to the value of four million because the, the amounts don't match. There'll be an amount over or under hedged. Now, it's not always the case that they can be exactly matched, but they need to be reasonably well matched in terms of the amount. So that's what makes it effective. So remember the requirements here are the items must be eligible, we need to formally document and designate the hedge, and it must be effective. And to be effective, there must be 
an economic relationship, the change in value can't be caused by credit risk, and the hedged amounts should match. So that's what makes it a hedge, and we're going to look at some actual hedges shortly. But we just want to get the rules out there first, and then we'll look at the treatment. The last bit I want to mention here is when to discontinue the hedge. Well, the rules are that we'll stop and de-recognize the hedge and no longer designate it as a hedge if the instrument is de-recognized, if we're no longer party to the hedging instrument. Let's say we were using a futures contract and we close out the contract. Well, obviously, we can't then have it in our hedging uh, designation. If the criteria were no longer met, so for example, the instrument was no longer eligible, it wasn't designated properly, or the effectiveness rules weren't met. Or indeed, the future cash flow was no longer probable. We're going to look at a cash flow hedge, which is hedging a future cash flow, i.e. something you're going to pay in the future. Well, if you're no longer going to pay it, well then, you can no longer hedge it. So if you don't have to use or pay the cash flow, well then you won't be able to hedge it. So those are when we stop, and when you discontinue it, you do it prospectively. What I mean by that is you don't go back and change what you did up to that point. So it may have been a hedge up to that point, that's fine. You don't go back and change that. You just change it from then onwards. Lastly on this, if you're discontinuing the hedging relationship, you may have some gains or losses in reserves, which you'll see when we come to look at the treatment for the hedges. The rule for those is that any gains and losses that are in your reserves at the moment, you take to the profit and loss if the cash flow is now not happening. So you were going to have a cash flow, it's now not happening. Any gains and losses on the hedge now go to profit or loss. If the cash flow is happening, well then you wait for the cash flow and then take it to profit or loss. Once again, that will make much more sense when we look at a cash flow hedge, but I'm just putting the rules out here first. So to discontinue a hedge, we do it if the instrument is derecognized, we no longer meet the criteria for a hedge, or we were doing it to hedge a future cash flow that's no longer going to happen. We don't go back and change our previous treatment, we just do it moving forward. And if we have any gains or losses in reserves, take it to profit or loss if the cash flow is not happening, or wait until the cash flow to happen uh, if it is going to happen in the future. So those are all the rules. We know the requirements, we know what makes it effective, and we know what to do when we discontinue it. But what are the types of hedge that we might actually have here? Well, there are two types that IFRS 9 outlines and that we need to be able to deal with. They're very similar, but there's a slightly different treatment for each. So first of all, we have a fair value hedge. And the difference between these two relates to the hedged item, i.e. the thing that you are hedging. So in this instance, we're hedging an item in our financial statements that's recognized at fair value through profit and loss. So we're hedging an item recognized at fair value through profit and loss. So for example, we have um, some shares in another entity. So we have those shares in another entity, we're recognizing them at fair value through profit and loss, and we're worried that they'll go down in value. So what will we do? We will take out a hedging instrument to try to offset those losses. But how do we measure them? Well, because both are measured at fair value, i.e. the item and the instrument, it's actually quite easy. We can recognize both of them in profit or loss and they'll offset each other. So we have a gain or loss on the hedged item, the shares, and we have a gain or loss on the hedging instrument, the derivative taking out to hedge the risk, and we can simply take them both to profit or loss and offset them. 
The only time this can be a little bit tricky is if you're hedging something that's not at fair value through profit and loss, but at fair value through other comprehensive income. And it's not really tricky, you just need to remember that instead of going to profit and loss, you'll take both to other comprehensive income. So let's see how that will work in illustration three. You should be able to do this. All I want you to do is take the hedged item and measure it at fair value through profit and loss. Then take the hedging instrument, measure it at fair value through profit and loss and see if they offset each other in the profit and loss account. So have a go at that and then work through the answer with me. In this illustration, we're looking at a fair value hedge. We have a bond, which is basically an item at fair value through profit and loss in our accounts. So it's classified as fair value through profit and loss. It's a financial asset and its initial fair value is two million. They enter into an interest rate swap, which has a fair value of zero. Remember, if we see that, we know this is a derivative and we're even told that it's designated as a derivative and is effective. It's actually expected to be 100% effective, so it should equally offset the movement on our bond. So market interest rates rise to 7% and the bond decreases in value to 1920. So the double entry to record this. So the bond is a hedged item. It's a fair value hedge and we're told that it's recognized at fair value through profit and loss. So any movement will go there. So on the bond, we have a movement from 2 million to 1920, which is 80,000. So we'll debit the income statement and credit the financial asset, the bond, with the 80,000. So that will reduce its value from the 2 million to the 1920. So that's the first side of the hedge. We've dealt with the hedged item, and that means that the fair value of the swap on the other side has increased by the same. It's 100% effective, which means it's going to offset any changes in the fair value of the bond. So the fair value of the swap will have increased by 80,000. Since the swap is a derivative, it's measured at fair value through profit and loss, the same as our hedged item. So the entries will be debit the swap with the 80,000, credit the income statement or the P&L with 80,000. And you can see that the debit and the credit to the P&L will therefore offset each other. So the changes in the value of the hedged item and the hedging instrument exactly offset as the hedge is 100% effective and the net effect on profit or loss is zero. So that's how a fair value hedge should work. Now, it's not always the case that it will equally and oppositely offset the movement, it may not be 100% effective, but theoretically this is how it should happen. So we know how to do one of our two methods of hedge accounting, a fair value hedge. We simply measure each item to fair value and we take it to profit and loss if that's where it's going or if it's an item that's fair value through other comprehensive income, take it there instead and they should offset each other. What about then the second which is a cash flow hedge? Now again, the difference here comes in the item that you're hedging. This is where we're hedging a change in a future cash flow. Now what that means is you're going to have to pay an amount in the future and you're worried about the effect of, for example, foreign exchange changes. Let's say that you had to pay 1 million euros in six months time and you're worried that the euro exchange rate will change and you will incur a loss. So what you could do is undertake a hedge through a forward rate or indeed through a future or an option, etc. Now one key aspect here is that the cash flow has to be highly probable to happen. 
Remember when we looked at discontinuing a hedge, we said that if the cash flow was no longer probable, you couldn't have a hedge. So this is the example I was talking about. So if you didn't have something that was probable to happen, you couldn't do this. Or maybe midway through, you realize that it's now not probable. You'd have to discontinue the hedge. So it's hedging a future cash flow. The importance here is that it's a future cash flow. So there's no impact on your profit yet. Now that means that we can't offset the movements in our hedged item against our movements in our hedging instrument because our hedged item, the cash flow, hasn't happened yet. So we can't offset them. So in order to get around that, the treatment is that we basically record the instrument in other comprehensive income. Now one key bit here is that we only take the effective portion to other comprehensive income. Now the effective bit means that, let's say for example, we had hedged a cash flow of 1 million. So the cash flow was 1 million and the movement in the exchange rate meant that we were now going to have to pay 1.1 million. So a movement of 100,000. We'd hope to offset the 100,000 through our hedging instrument. Let's say our hedging instrument had moved by 110,000. So it had moved by more than our hedged item. We'd effectively over hedged. Well, the effective portion would be the 100,000. The extra 10,000, that would go to profit and loss. So the treatment is, you take it to other comprehensive income for the effective bit, but if you've over hedged, then that's going to go to profit or loss. Then when the cash flow occurs, the amount that you have in other comprehensive income or in reserves now will be transferred to profit or loss to offset the cash flow amount. So the treatment is, take it to other comprehensive income for the effective amount, show it in reserves, and when the cash flow occurs, then take it to profit and loss. Let's just make sure we can do that in illustrations four and five. Once again, for illustration four, I think you should be able to have a go at it. You just need to work out the movements again, only this time it'll go to other comprehensive income until the cash flow actually happens. In this illustration, we have a cash flow hedge. So that's hedging a future cash flow. In this instance, we intend to buy 1,000 ounces of gold at whatever market price there is at that date. The current price is $1,200 per ounce. Now, we will be worried that the price is going to go up. So we enter into a future contract to buy it at $1,300 per ounce. Designated as a hedge, so we can do our hedging treatment. And we're given details about the prices of the market value and the future on different dates. And we're told to give the impact at 31st of October and then 31st of January. So let's start with the 31st of October. So that's the year end. And on that date, the futures price is $1,400 per ounce. The market price of gold is 1325. So that means that we have a gain on the futures contract. The gain on the futures contract is the difference between the futures price we took it out at, which was 1300, and the price now, which is 1400 times $1,000, which is $100,000 of a gain on the futures contract. Now we will initially recognize that in reserves and that will be debit the financial asset 100,000 and credit reserves through other comprehensive income with 100,000. And do notice at this point that the market price of gold has changed from 1200 to 1325. But that's actually a bigger change. So that's $125 of a change on the market price, 
whereas our futures contract is only changed by 100. But it does mean that all of our change in the futures contract will go to covering that change in the market price. So it's not quite fully effective, but it will cover most of the change in the market price on the 31st of October. Now, by the 31st of January, we find that actually the futures contract is settled at 1450 and the gold is completed at a price of 1350. So what will happen on that date is that both parts can be taken to profit or loss. So the purchase of the gold will be 1000 ounces at 1350. So we still go ahead and buy the gold, but we're just hoping that our futures contract will offset the change in value. The futures contract has increased from the $1,300 when we took it out to $1,450 when we close it. So that's $150 times 1,000 ounces, which is 150,000 of a gain. So that is going to be given to us from the futures exchange. So credit the gain on the future, debit cash. Now what that means is that effectively, if you take the debit for the purchase of the gold and the credit for the gain on the future, the net effect is that we paid 1.2 million or $1,200 per ounce. And that was the prevailing price when we took out the futures contract. So the hedge has done what we intended it to do. It sealed our price at the date we took it out of 1,200. It did that by us going ahead with the purchase at the prevailing market rate, but having a gain on the futures contract that we took out that offset the losses that we made on the actual purchase of the gold. And that's the way these are designed to work. Because this was a cash flow hedge, initially any gains were taken to other comprehensive income. And then when the cash flow happened, we took it all to profit or loss. So that's how a cash flow hedge should work. I want to just look at an instance where the movement on our hedging instrument doesn't match the movement on our hedged item because we said that the effective bit will go to OCI, the rest will go to profit or loss. Now let's see what I mean by that. So looking at this illustration, so illustration five in your workbook, we intend to buy 1000 barrels of oil, current price $95 per barrel. They hedge the risk by taking out a futures contract at 100. And by the year end, oil price is 150, futures price 160. How should the hedge be treated? So at the year end, the movement on the cash flow is the difference between the current price of 95 and the price at the year end, 150. And it's for 1,000 barrels of oil. So that's a 55,000 loss. We'd have to pay 150 instead of 95 for each barrel. So 55,000 of a loss. However, we took out the futures contract. The change on it is from 100 to 160 for 1,000 barrels, which is a 60,000 gain. Now in this instance, unlike the previous illustration where the movement on the future didn't actually cover the movement on the cash flow, we've got more here. So actually, there's a portion of this that's effective and a portion that isn't. The portion that's effective is the bit that covers the movement on the cash flow. So that's the 55,000 and that amount, the 55,000, should go to other comprehensive income. The ineffective bit, the 5,000 remaining of the gain, will go to profit or loss. So that's what I mean by, for a cash flow hedge, the effective portion goes to other comprehensive income, with the ineffective portion going to profit or loss. Still again then, once the cash flow actually happens, then we take it all to profit or loss. But that's just an example of how to treat it if they don't exactly match.
So that then was our session on hedge accounting. I know it can seem a little bit technical, but it's really worth getting to grips with. If you can do that and learn those different rules, it actually can provide you with very good marks in the exam. You don't need to go into too much detail. The examiner understands that it's a technical area. So just being able to talk about each aspect at a basic level will get you marks. So please don't shy away from it. Try to get to grips with it so that you can deal with the question should it arise.